All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm just checking the screen here to make sure we have all of our guests in the room now, and I believe that we do. So thank you for joining this evening. Uh, this is one of our policy exchange events. Um, and, and what we'd like to do in these events uh, is to give people who are thinking about graduate study at the Shore School a chance to experience what is a graduate school level conversation debate like? What is that conversation like? What is that uh, exchange of ideas like? And um, uh, Dr. Greg Koblenz, who heads the biodefense master's and PhD here at the uh, Shar School of Policy and Government, he's going to uh, introduce the panel and tell you a little bit more about sort of the structure of the evening. But on the behalf of the admissions team, um, we're really glad that you joined us tonight. Uh, and we're looking forward to giving you kind of a preview of what, the, what it's like in the biodefense classroom. And um, well, with that, Greg, how about you take it away? All right. Thank you, Travis. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to this Shar School Policy Exchange on the Future of Global Health Security. Uh, again, my name is Greg Koblenz. I'm director of the Biodefense Graduate Program and associate professor here at the Shar School, uh, and I'll be moderating tonight's uh, event. Uh, for the last several decades, you know, a steady parade of new diseases has emerged and spread around the world. First, it was HIV, then SARS, then H5N1, then H1N1, then MERS, then Ebola, and then Zika. And each time we confronted one of these uh, new diseases, we found gaps and weaknesses in the global health system and adopted new policies to try and close those gaps. But of course, nothing in living memory rivals COVID-19 for the level of um, disruption this pandemic has caused on top of the steep and growing human toll of this outbreak. Uh, unfortunately, the US response, both domestically and internationally, has been very slow and disjointed. Uh, the global response to the pandemic has been lack lackluster to say the least. Uh, and we've seen more competition than cooperation in the international response to COVID. This raises important questions about the steps we need to take to strengthen global health security to prevent the next uh, novel respiratory virus outbreak from becoming a global pandemic. Uh, the bad news is we only have 60 minutes today to discuss the failures of the global health system and how to fix them. Uh, the good news is that we have a stellar panel of faculty from the biodefense program here at the Shara School uh, to discuss these issues and answer your questions. So I'm going to uh, introduce our, um, our panelists uh, and then we'll um, uh, discuss a couple of kind of, you know, key issues in, in terms of the future of global health security for about a half hour or so, and then we're going to open up uh, for questions from the audience. And when we do that, please just use the raise hand function on Zoom, and then um, uh, when I call on you, you'll be able to ask your question to either the entire panel or individual uh, professors, uh, depending on, on your question. So uh, by way of introduction, uh, we have with us tonight uh, Dr. Ashley Grant, who is a lead biotechnologist at the MITRE Corporation, uh, and she runs their uh, countering WMD group. Uh, she previously worked with the uh, Government Accountability Office, the Chemical and Biological Defense Program in the Department of Defense, and the National Academies of Sciences. Uh, Dr. Grant received her PhD in experimental pathology from the University of Texas a Medical Branch in Galveston, where she studied viral hemorrhagic fevers in a BSL-4 lab. Uh, she teaches courses in the biodefense program on global health security policy, and on national security program evaluation. Dr. Andrew Kiliansky is currently the senior director of the Emerging Infectious Diseases uh, Unit at IAVI, an international science nonprofit that develops vaccines and therapeutics against a range of infectious diseases. Uh, prior to working at IAVI, Dr. Kiliansky worked at the Department of Defense as a senior scientist and a program manager. He received his PhD in microbiology and immunology from Loyola University in Chicago, where he discovered virus host interactions necessary for coronavirus pathogenesis. Uh, and Dr. Kilansky teaches courses uh, for the program on virology and on biosurveillance. Dr. Popescu uh, is an epidemiologist and infection control professional with years of experience working in the front lines of outbreak response in hospitals, including during this pandemic. She currently serves as a member of the Federation of American Scientists Coronavirus Task Force as a member of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Data Needs to Monitor Evolution of SARS-CoV-2. She received her PhD in biodefense from the Shaw School and teaches courses uh, in the program on healthcare resilience and epidemiology. Uh, so now let me uh, start with uh, asking a couple questions of our, our panelists to start our, our event off tonight. And then again, we'll open up uh, questions for the audience uh, in a little bit. Uh, so I think you know, one of the, the things that a lot of us in the field have been wondering is that uh, even though the World Health Organization uh, back in 2018 started warning about disease X, you know, a novel pathogen that could uh, cause a major uh, international disease outbreak, um, 
uh, even though we've the, the organization was warning for, for several years about the possibility of this disease, the world was caught so off guard and unprepared for SARS-CoV-2 when it emerged in late 2019. Uh, so um, uh, th this question for, uh, for, for Dr. Grant, um, you know, what do you think accounts for um, the failure for the WHO and the industry community to be more prepared given the warnings they've been raising for the past several years? Sure, great question. Um, I think a variety of different uh, things that we, we address some of this in my class is looking at, according to all the indicators in terms of the Global Health Security Index, um, the United States was the most well-prepared country, um, same with other ones. And then when you actually look at how they did uh, with COVID-19, um, it doesn't really line up with how prepared in terms of all the metrics of success that we were supposed to have. Um, so I think it's it's how we measure it and how we thought we were trying to prepare it doesn't really align with uh, how we actually responded. Um, I think throughout this pandemic, um, there's been a lot of data uh, in terms of both good data, but also mis and disinformation, um, as well as a gap in terms of communication with individuals, which is super important, especially at the beginning. If we go back to the beginning of 2020, uh, 20, we didn't know a lot about this virus. We didn't know if it could spread through fomite, aka surface transmission. We didn't even know that it was aerosolizable. Um, again, if we go back to that beginning uh, part of 2020, um, Chinese, uh, China didn't even admit that it was spread from human to human transmission. So learning more about the virus and being able to uh, perform risk communication. So that's an actual science in terms of performing risk communication. Um, so I think that's a lot of where we, every country went wrong. Um, and then just learning more about this disease X in terms of, uh, even though we had, we know that it was related to, uh, closely related to SARS coronavirus one, which was, there was an outbreak in 2003. So at least we did know um, a lot of things about the virus in terms of um, what, what, what part of the virus was immunogenic um, and, and knew some things about the virus, but a lot of things we didn't know. So um, I think by collaborating in the future, um, I think by better risk communication, and then obviously, as you brought up, working together. So across the different um, countries, uh, sharing research. I think this is also one of the first pandemics I've been part of that um, there's been literally instantaneous publications and um, that aren't peer reviewed. <laughs> so um, I think I started to see that with Zika and even Ebola, but this is the first one where literally um, you can publish a paper without even peer reviewing it and it literally picked up by the press the next day. So, um, and then some of those uh, are scary results that um, make people scared or are taken out of context. So I think I wanted to bring up the example of the cruise ship and uh, the virus surviving 21 days. And uh, I think that there was a miscommunication in terms of actual um, live virus versus uh, viral RNA, which is the, just the nucleic acid or material from the virus um, being found 21 days later. So I just think, um, and that, that article was changed later on and newspaper articles were changed, but I think by reading those things, um, it makes people scared. It um, perpetuates mis and disinformation. And I think that was a huge uh, problem with this outbreak. Um, another thing just to, to build on um, the response to why weren't we prepared or better prepared for disease X, I think we're really prepared for uh, a couple cases of a highly infectious disease um, that might not, and, it, and it's very obvious when it's uh, diagnosed or it has obvious symptoms. Um, but I think um, diagnostics was also a huge um, issue with this pandemic. Um, and even now, I don't really trust the diagnostics, especially a rapid test um, in terms of the false negative um, rates. And even when you get tested is su super important. We still don't have um, diagnostics that we can trust to make actionable decisions sometimes. So um, I think those are some things that uh, come across in terms of uh, reactions to that question in terms of uh, why weren't we better prepared for disease X. And, and I think what's particularly kind of concerning with, with that list is that a lot of these issues we haven't even resolved today, almost two years in the pandemic. Uh, and so just to follow up on, on one of the just to pull one of the threads that you you put out there in terms of the, the role of misinformation, disinformation, the WHO has declared that we have an infodemic of bad information alongside the, the pandemic. 
Uh, so I'm wondering uh, maybe if, if Dr. Popescu, who's kind of been doing a lot of work on, on the front lines of, uh, in terms of epidemiology, infection control, could talk a little bit about how that misinformation, disinformation has interfered with the pandemic response and you know, to what extent have we learned lessons about how to counter that disinformation and, and try and um, you know, improve our response to the pandemic? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. I think misinformation and disinformation and just overall challenges in science communication or SciComm, as we often call it, it's probably been one of our biggest hurdles. Unfortunately, this is a very, in some ways, new but not new concept. We struggled with it a bit in during the Ebola outbreak in 2014. But what we have been seeing with COVID-19 is really that our ability to translate um, important everyday information is not as strong as we had hoped. So one of the lessons is conveying nuanced information in a way that people can understand it, but take the lessons and apply it in situations. So for example, how COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes it is transmitted. It's simple, but also nuanced in some ways. So how can we communicate this in a way that is not overly complex, but not overly simplified that people can take those lessons and translate it to everyday life, because we find that if we create very specific scenarios that can help, but it can also hinder in some ways. So that's the first piece. But the other one is very early on, we found that if we gave people very specific dates in terms of, all right, you know, May 1st, we'll be out of quarantine or, um, you know, by the end of the fall, we can start getting things back to normal. And this is going to be a hard guidance. We really kind of put ourselves into a box. And the truth is that science communication and the ability to translate information overall really requires us to encourage people to flex into evolving data and evolving science and comms because more and more, this is a novel situation. You know, we actually learned this with Ebola in 2014. While Ebola is not a novel disease, we had never really experienced it on the front lines here in healthcare in the United States. So what did that mean for how we translated it to healthcare workers and the guidance we were giving in a very novel situation? So with COVID-19, early on, we wanted to give people hope and very specific guidance, but we found that when we were putting ourselves into that situation, we weren't explaining, this is a really evolving situation and we need to be able to lean into the changes because that means we're getting better at fighting COVID and understanding COVID. So yes, things are going to change, but that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. And probably one of the things I personally find that we have struggled with so much is very little um, training in, in public health and infectious disease goes into science communication and communicating these complex nuanced topics to the general public in ways that they can find helpful and um, encouraging, but also comforting. So I think that this has been one of the most challenging situations, especially with the speed of light that things are spreading on, you know, social media like Twitter and Instagram, the WHO is really working on this. So overall, I think science communication is something I know for my healthcare resilience and epidemiology and policy classes, we're really having those conversations about, it's not just understanding the concepts, it's understanding the way to communicate it. Yeah, so I, I think there definitely are some some important lessons learned. I think a, a lot of it is a matter of implementation of, of those lessons. Um, uh, to pick up one of the other themes that Dr. Grant mentioned about the role of technology, that clearly technology has played a huge role in our response to the, the pandemic. So I'm just wondering, uh, Dr. Kiliansky, if you could comment on, you know, we, should we take for granted the fact that we can now have vaccines against new infectious diseases in a year? Or was this, you know, response to COVID-19 uh, extraordinary or, or are these um, mRNA vaccine platform technologies, you know, are these really revolutionary for global health? Yeah, so uh, that's a great topic. And, you know, just for the folks here, I'm teaching a class tonight, so I'm actually in one of the classrooms. I just want to, you know, give everyone an insider's view into the star school. Right. So I've got, um, I've got the Zoom background of the <laughs> fake classroom. You have the real classroom there, so... Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, really appreciate the opportunity to, to meet everyone here today. Uh, yeah, so in terms of vaccine technology, right, and this is coming from someone who was on Operation Warp Speed, who was working on the vaccines uh, right at the height of the pandemic, and then now outside of the U.S. government are, are developing vaccines for SARS-CoV-2, uh, as well as a, a variety of different emerging infectious diseases. In a lot of ways, we got extremely fortunate with, with our vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. So we took essentially two main vaccine platforms, the mRNA platform, which you've heard about from Pfizer and Moderna, 
and adenovirus-based uh, vectors from J&J &J and AstraZeneca. Not, and none of those vaccines has ever been demonstrated to be efficacious for anything before. And you know, so we were able to take these vaccines, which were definitely cutting edge, right, but hadn't been through the rigor of more um, you know, tested vaccine approaches. And we're able to bring them in. And, and fortunately, with a disease like SARS-CoV-2, uh, it was amenable to the approaches and the routes of administration and the immune response generated by the mRNA and the adenovirus platforms. I think what we're seeing out there in industry is definitely a push towards these platform technologies, which use the same production process every time, have a similar regulatory package that would go to the FDA for a, a different virus or bacteria, whatever pathogen you might be interested in. So we're starting to really standardize that, that field with these platform technologies, and that's definitely going to accelerate things going forward. But, you know, SARS-CoV-2 on the, on the surface from uh, an immune response perspective is a relatively simple pathogen where we were able to develop a neutralizing response with our vaccines against the spike protein, right, the protein that sticks out, outside uh, of the virus that binds the receptors on our cells. If it was something like HIV, for example, and we took one of the surface proteins from HIV and, and tried the same approaches, uh, we would have been unsuccessful. Right? We've been searching for an HIV AIDS vaccine for over 25 years. So, you know, in a lot of ways, we were fortunate in, in the pathogen that we faced, you know, SARS-CoV-2, and we were familiar with some of the, you know, immune responses that you'd want to see out of a vaccine. Uh, I think it'd be foolish to think that it, the mRNA platform or the adenovirus platform is going to be universal for every pathogen that's out there. Um, right. If anything, viruses have taught us that we need to be uh, really judicious in how we think about uh, combating them, whether that's with antibody therapies, uh, small molecule inhibitors, or vaccines. And what's really clear, you know, going off Saskia's question, uh, we need to do more than just make vaccines. <laughs> you know, we're we're in a space where we have these really effective, very safe vaccines. And we can't communicate them effectively enough to, to the US population, as well as others around the world that they're safe to take and they work. Um, so it, it's, it's a one thing to really invest in these platforms and have a vaccine for everything that's on the list. If we can't get people to get vaccinated, uh, that's gonna be a problem. So, you know, it's those sorts of socio, uh, this, these societal factors, right? The psychology that underlies uh, how we think about these things, which is gonna be very important going forward. Um, you know, a lot of the, the US government, WHO, CEPI, all of these international organizations are looking at these windows of 100 days to 200 days to have either a therapeutic or a vaccine. I think with, with the platforms and, and the investment that's being made right now in the manufacturing space and the regulatory science that underpins a lot of these, we're gonna get pretty close to that. Uh, the challenge is, is just going to be, you know, what do we do about disease X um, and how can we incorporate an understanding of vaccines, the biology, how these things work, why public health is important to everybody, right? So that everyone's working from a common foundation here. Uh, you know, we, we knew, we understood pretty early on that we were going to have some issues with vaccine uptake. I don't think anyone could have predicted that it would be to the scale it is now. But those are things that you have to build into your um, public health awareness campaigns every day. Um, and I, I think we could do a lot with really describing how these vaccines work, understanding how our bodies uh, you know, uptake these vaccines and how it's different than getting infected with SARS-CoV-2. And I, you know, finally, the mRNA platform and the antivirus platform are some of the cleanest and safest vaccines that we know about. I, I mean, when you look at some of the vaccines we get as kids, uh, those are attenuated pathogens, and we don't really know why they're attenuated. Uh, there are things that were developed 100 years ago, right, that haven't really underwent a whole lot of process improvement uh, in that time frame, right, and they work, and they're effective, and they're safe. Uh, and now we're using very um, targeted technologies, right, made at scale in very clean, uh, you know, regulated, um, super regulated conditions that we have here during the pandemic. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of education that we could be doing to ensure that vaccine uptake issues is not going to be an issue going forward. Yeah, it's interesting you point out that this, there's this paradox where the science technology of vaccine production has outpaced the social and political ability to get people to actually receive the vaccine when, it, when it's available. And this actually speaks to kind of one of the, the key uh, philosophical foundations of the biodefense program, which is uh, really the need to bridge the gap between science and policy. 
it's not enough just to know how to make the vaccine. We also need to have the policies in place to uh, make sure those vaccines are safe, safe and efficacious, but also to convince the public through you know, uh, communication strategies and, and media campaigns right, that, that this is uh, something that they should be taking as well. So that, that's just one of many issues that kind of shows that intersection of science and policy. And that's really one of the things that the biodefense program really, really focuses on. I mean, I'm going to highlight something here, Greg, real quick. So I'm, I'm on the Google News homepage, and I've got two fact checks there in the box on the right. Um, one of the fact checks, apparently, there's a story that says, did a Delta pilot die mid-flight due to a COVID-19 vaccination? Um, and then the second fact check here is fact check, did vaccines eradicate smallpox? Right. So here we have one of the greatest public health victories ever based on, you know, a foundation of public outreach and vaccination and the eradication of smallpox. And that's that's not something that we talk about. Right. That's not really a common educational topic. You know, and then we have these ridiculous things where, you know, uh, anyone who's who's at any science course would tell you, you know, that doesn't really sound right. Um, but these things are amplifying. And uh you know, just uh, we see these things every day in all sorts of venues, and it's really a it's it's a crisis. Um, you know, in the biodefense course, we talk a lot about uh, you know biotechnology going forward, how we're going to use biotech for a bunch of different things. Uh, if we can't get people to take a vaccine, you know, when we talk about modifying organisms or using E. coli to make things that we use every day, you know, there's going to be a lot of challenges in you know, for the U.S. economy when it comes to accepting some of the benefits of these uh, biotechnology-enabled uh, um, advances in the future. And, and we actually have a course that's offered by uh, one of Dr. Grant's colleagues at, at MITRE uh, on uh, biotechnology and society that looks at th these kinds of issues about public acceptance of biotechnology, the role of the bioeconomy, uh, and, and how to kind of communicate effectively about the you know, uh, advantages and limitations of what biotechnology can and can't do. Um, so that, that's just yet, yet another area where um, uh, we, we do have um, courses uh, available. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Dr. Popescu teaches a class on healthcare resilience. And since we have unfortunately had this, you know, re resistance to vaccines, or in some cases, there are many countries that don't have enough vaccine yet. And so we see over and over again these surges in, in COVID cases in, in either in different countries or states in the U.S. that just you know uh, overwhelm the hospital systems, um, and you know leads to obviously very bad outcomes for the COVID patients. But on top of that, uh, uh, patients who have totally unrelated conditions can't get treatments because the ICU beds are full or the nursing staff is um, is, is, is you know is not sufficient. So uh, I'm just wondering if Dr. Popescu could share some thoughts about how, um, you know, what are the reforms necessary for the healthcare system to become more resilient? So in the event of the next pandemic, we don't have these situations where hospitals are kind of, you know, collapsing or being crippled by the, the flood of, of uh, patients that they're receiving. Um, thanks, Dr. Koblenz. I think there's many factors. For one, we really learned a lot about supply chains with COVID-19, you know, masks, but also gowns, disinfectants were something that I think we all kind of always took for granted. Early on, we saw a lot of hospitals stockpiling, which actually created a lot of stress on the existing supply chains for N95s and even KN95s. So we learned a lot about the waste, if you will. Medical waste is actually a really common topic, unfortunately, because we burn through masks and we learned about the importance of reusable and sustainable medical supplies. But in a healthcare setting, there's actually really not a lot of incentive, believe it or not, to prepare for events and definitely not infectious disease events. So what you'll see often is that hospitals have to have plans for emergency situations like um, bomb threats or, you know, biological events like a terrorist, a bioterrorist attack or a pandemic event um, or, you know, even an active shooter. But they get to decide which one they're going to invest time in and energy in, meaning they're going to do drills, they're going to do um, tabletop exercises. And there's not a lot of regulatory oversight about what goes into this. And now, of course, this is very much in resource rich countries and very, um, you know, privileged hospital systems that get to focus on that. But this means that hospitals ultimately dictate what priorities get set for their preparedness. And often that means biopreparedness falls to the wayside. And of course, this is a little ironic, you know, prior to, and of course now speaking in the middle of, and hopefully towards the tail end of a pandemic, 
But it's a reminder that when we have healthcare systems that get to dictate what they invest in for preparedness, they're ultimately going to decide. If you have one that really finds infectious disease threats a high risk, they're going to be more prepared inherently than others. So there's this very fractured patchwork, patchwork, excuse me, approach to biopreparedness within the U.S. And the other piece to this too is at a national level, how we view hospital readiness is a little bit skewed. You know, we thought we learned a lot in 2014 from Ebola, but the truth is that we approach healthcare preparedness for biological events, assuming a certain amount of readiness, which is inaccurate, but also that hospital biopreparedness is a mixture of healthcare providers and things like ventilators. And more and more, we realize everything from masks to ancillary staff, like respiratory therapists and infection preventionists and environmental services all play such a critical role that if we only focus on a small amount of that healthcare resilience, we're inherently setting ourselves up for failure. So this, you know, pandemic has shed light on so much that we really need to be focusing on within a healthcare setting, but more and more that we have not been focusing on biological events for a long time. And, and I think that, uh, you know, it is in part an, an issue at the, the national level where uh, the priorities of different administrations and uh, different agencies have, have fluctuated over time and haven't necessarily uh, you know, implemented the lessons that have been learned from Ebola or Zika or H1N1 uh, and, and these other outbreaks we've been having. Um, let, let me ask folks, if, if you're not uh, one of the speakers, please mute your um, mute yourself so that we don't hear the, the background noise. Thank you. Um, so um, in, in looking at how, um, you know, different um, leadership you know, matters in this in this context, uh, this question for, for Dr. Grant, because the, the Biden administration has really tried to reestablish a leadership role for the United States in global health security. And I'm just wondering what your assessment is of, of how successful this has been so far and what more does the Biden administration need to do uh, at the global health level to try and not just deal with the current pandemic, but prepare for the next one? Um, I think there's a lot of positive things that the Biden administration has been doing in terms of reestablishing the importance of WHO and knowing that it is a world problem. Uh, the viruses don't know borders. Um, so um, re-engaging with the world in terms of making sure that we share knowledge, share vaccines. Um, so that's starting to happen. Um, I also just think being a player in terms of communicating and then also just Doing, doing best practices in terms of um, the best way to um, show that masks are important and social distancing is important is um, to, to do it yourself. So I think that's another thing in terms of um, wearing masks, um, emphasizing social distancing um, obviously is very important. I think there's a couple of missteps that the current administration has made in terms of um, especially looking at how the mask mandate was repealed um, before we had enough evidence. Uh, and then also just how the mask repeal might lead to additional vaccination. I'm not sure that everybody saw that logic in terms of, oh, I can take off my mask if I get vaccinated. I'm not sure that knowing um, that individuals might not follow that logic um, and, and knowing the audience uh, or even studying the audience of people that aren't getting vaccinated and the reasons why would have been beneficial. Um, I think there's been a lot of good things in terms of, and, and still good things in terms of um, sharing information, even um, talking with world leaders about um, vaccination uh, cards and, and how to prove vaccination status when you're traveling. Um, so a lot of positive steps, but a couple of missteps as well. And I want to give Dr. Kilinski and Dr. Pesky a chance to, to weigh in on and things that they particularly liked in terms of what the Biden administration has done recently or, or things that are, are left undone that need more, more time or attention or funding. Yes, yeah, so, so um, to ask if it's okay, I'll, I'll start there. Uh, so, you know, I think everyone's, you know, heads and hearts are in the right place. Um, I, I am a little bit concerned with uh, you know, there's uh, figures being thrown out there in terms of funding doesn't seem to be enough, uh, especially when you consider the really the economic uh, impacts of the pandemic. You know, if we we could probably spend somewhere on the order of 50 billion dollars a year for 100 years 
right? And, uh, you know, equal the, the international economic impact of the pandemic just over a year and a half. So in terms of resources, I think there's, there's some opportunities there. Uh, and then right as we're trying to improve upon the current response and the future response to the next pandemic, we really have to understand what we did right and what we did wrong when it comes to our response to COVID-19. Um, and without that sort of foundation, you know, I, I think we've got some challenges of spending that money, hiring the right people, right, building an infrastructure to really figure this out for the future going forward. Um, so I, I definitely think there's some analysis that you need to do to really understand, especially within the U.S., why we were disproportionately, you know, either underprepared or ill-prepared or prepared in the wrong areas compared to some of the rest of the world. Right. When you look at the overall uh, number of fatalities related to COVID-19, and sure, there's issues counting uh, that sort of data around the world, but you know, the U.S. at over 600,000, uh, you know, is a huge proportion of the you know four and a half million deaths around the world um, related to, like Ashley mentioned at the beginning, right? How prepared we were assessed to be. So, uh, you know, regardless, we've spent a lot of money, a lot of time on this issue. Maybe not you know, in the right, uh, in the right areas, but we have to figure out what we did wrong, as well as what we did right in order to really ensure that our response apparatus or preparedness apparatus uh, is going forward in the right direction. I entirely agree with both of you. I'm going to add to, I think part of this is having conversations with the right people. Too often I read uh, GAO reports that are you know, especially from my own uh, perspective, hospital administrators, very important role, very important voices. But to understand how a hospital responded to an event, you have to speak, you have to speak to the people on the front lines that were involved in that and that were struggling to respond or perhaps could give insight into that. So I think we need to really broaden our perspectives as to who's involved in response and ensuring that we have a really, really wide spectrum of conversations about what went right and what went wrong and more so what resources we need or don't need. So for example, when we had ventilators sent out from um, a lot of the strategic national stockpile and a lot of, you know, through FEMA, they sent them to hospitals, but without filters. Now I can't use a ventilator without a filter on an infectious patient or it's just gonna aerosolize their respiratory secretions. So having those conversations with people on the front lines about that's great that we got five ventilators, but we couldn't use them and all of those filters were on back order. So those are important conversations that need to get had moving forward. Okay, um, th this has been a, a really good conversation that's brought up a lot of issues that deserve further attention, um, both in the classroom and also in, in the policy domain. Um, so I wanna take a chance now to open this up to our, our audience here and uh, see if, if folks have uh, either specific questions for individual panelists or if you have a general question uh, that you want to throw it open to whoever wants to answer it, that would be fine. Uh, and again, please use the raise hand function on uh, Zoom and um, that will give me a chance to, to call on you. Hey, Greg, real quick, where for those who are not exactly Zoom experts, where is the raise? Oh, uh, and it, it is under the reactions the little smiley face with the plus sign reactions uh, icon, click on that and then uh, the raise hand option will pop up there. That's great, so, I think you have your first taker. Yes, okay, um, Kareem, go ahead. Uh, yes, so I guess my uh, question is for Dr. Grant. Um, I was gonna say, how do we uh, better do a better job of communicating uh, to the public in terms of the difference between something that's been peer reviewed, something that hasn't been uh, uh, peer reviewed for publication. Because I know I am, as a scientist, extremely skeptical of anything that's not peer reviewed um, and trying to explain the difference between uh, just seeing a, you know, uh, off the cuff news report from the mainstream media versus um, a peer reviewed uh, scientific publication was kind of, you know, difficult to get across to some, some people in the, in the community. That's a great question, uh, and I'm not sure that I have a good answer. Uh, we actually had this discussion in my class for about an hour in terms of trying to get to the bottom of this. Um, in terms of, I remember when my mom shares links with me, I always say, well, where, where'd you hear that? Where's the source? I want to read the actual paper. <laughs> um, and I think by being um, a scientist or part of um, the biodefense program, you learn to question the source, right? 
And that's a part of our training and part of education. So I actually think it gets kind of back to having a better educated public or having a public that asks questions or wants to read more. Um, and then I also think there's a lot in terms of social media, in terms of um, amplifying mis and disinformation um, that we can do a better job. And I've been a part of a couple efforts in terms of when we do see amplified information um, that we can put out a, a positive message or a message that clarifies um, and we call it myth busters. So I've actually wrote a couple myth busters recently um, to try to clarify a message that's been um, amplified or is going around social media or a news article. Um, so I think that's one way. But um, in terms of trying to communicate with the public, I, I don't know that there's, um, especially since news outlets um, and social media and anybody can post on the internet, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, so I think it really starts with a base um, education of our public. Uh, which is going to be difficult <laughs> in a long-term process. But I also think by trying to communicate, um, if you do see and, and, and watching it, information in terms of if you see a message that's amplified or um, going viral on the internet, then you can try to counter that and then and or notify the social media user platform that this information, this user is um, creating harm or amplifying disinformation. So um, just a couple thoughts in terms of trying to, to get something that people to read more about peer reviewed and, and look at peer reviewed rather than non peer reviewed. I'm not sure there's a really good, um, I'm not sure there's a really good uh, solution right now, but it's definitely a, a huge problem. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, go ahead, Dirk. Thanks a lot. Hello. I think it's another question maybe for Dr. Grant, or at least uh, you elaborated on uh, diagnostics and that uh, it's very difficult uh, currently. And I guess on the back of diagnostics, I'm also thinking about uh, that there was this long debate, is it airborne or not? How is transmission? And I was wondering if you or somebody else could talk a little bit about your thoughts uh, about technology or like how could this be fixed or in which direction would you think that, that there is some kind of a lack of the right tools to fix that problem? Because I guess the next infectious disease will have uh, similar issues. Well, I go back to... Uh... I look at other countries in terms of uh, if you go traveling, there's literally little um, trailers for back, uh, for diagnose, like doing diagnostic testing. You can actually get the results in 30 minutes for a rapid test and or within 24 hours for a PCR test. And it's everywhere. It's easy to get. Yet people in the United States, um, even around here in the D.C. area, if they um, are concerned and are symptomatic, trying to find a test around here, even an appointment for a rapid test is extremely difficult, which at this point we're in the pandemic, um, if, you know, if you have a, a slight fever, you want that information, it should be easy, it should be quick. Um, there should be uh, trailers on the corner or really simple tests that you can trust. Um, at this point, we have the technology and other countries do. Um, but for some reason, we have a disconnect between um, the technology and actually administering it and getting it out to the people that actually need it. Because if I am symptomatic, just for instance, I think I have allergies, I should be able to test myself quickly, get a result, and then make actionable decisions of if I should quarantine or isolate myself or not. Instead, people don't, and they come to work sick, they expose other people because they don't, they can't get that information that's important to them. Um, your other point about um, the aerosolized uh, versus non aerosolized and how it's transmission transmitted. Um, I think there's a gap in terms of um, labs that are able to actually grow the virus itself and then uh, in different conditions. So there's not that many labs that can do the experiment of looking at um, 
how long the virus actually survives in the air uh, in different UV, different humidities and different temperatures. So once we had that information, a lot of people were looking at, again, that RNA, if, if the nucleic acid of the virus or the internal um, information was there. But that doesn't mean that the virus is actually able to infect a person. Um, so those require, you know, uh, uh, biological safety levels, certain labs and certain abilities. Um, so once we had that data, we had better information about how long it survives under different conditions. Epidemiologically wise, we also know, um, and then other, with other diseases that they're super spreader events in terms of, and then looking at some examples, um, that's why we've changed some of the guidance over time. So in terms of um, changing it from 10 cumulative minutes to 15 cumulative um, from 10 continuous minutes to 15 cumulative minutes over a 24 hour period for a close contact. Um, we've also changed in terms of, um, we've learned a lot of information in terms of um, how far a person can spread it. Um, there's been a couple great examples that um, CDC hats off to them to um, put in morbidity and mortality weekly reports. Um, and always they do an infographic in terms of what you, you're supposed to take away. Um, we've learned a lot in terms of um, a, a teacher that infects a whole classroom when they're not wearing a mask, reading a story out loud, or um, an event, um, a gathering that has a, a lot of different people that are vaccinated that test positive um, called breakthrough cases. So uh, we've learned a lot in terms of how this, air, this virus can be aerosolized. And then also, again, there's different variants. So um, it could change at any point in terms of maybe uh, six feet is a um, big enough in terms of maybe it's more than that uh, or less than that um, based on what variant is spreading at the time. So we always have to keep um, continuing to study and learning about um, how long the virus can survive in the lab, but also looking epidemiologically wise, how it can actually spread from person to person and trying to figure out where they're infected. So that's really important as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Popesky, do you want to come in on this question about the the mode of transmission and it, how that matters both in terms of you know healthcare, but also how it matters in the public debate about SARS-CoV-2 and, and the risks of the virus? Yeah, you know, I I think one of the biggest challenges previously we had really approached respiratory transmission as very much a dichotomy: droplets or aerosols. Meaning, for for us in healthcare, aerosols meant airborne, and I think COVID-19 has really shed light on that. It's more so a spectrum. And while we used a dichotomy to explain things and make, make it a little bit easier from an infectious disease control perspective within a healthcare setting, the truth is that we need to spend a little bit more time explaining that nuance. And there has been, of course, a very lively debate about what airborne transmission means because for, you know, from an epidemiological perspective and an infectious infection prevention perspective like mine, it's a little bit different than perhaps an aerosol engineer and, you know, what is a culturable virus in a lab setting. So I, I think more and more this shed light into those conversations about nuance and that we need to be approaching these with teaching people what infectious disease transmission means and that not everything is so black and white. You know, we have and interventions that work, but you know they're not 100% perfect. That's that Swiss cheese model, meaning it's all of these layers because risk reduction is truly additive. And when we focus on one thing, you know, just masks or just ventilation, we do a disservice in creating that false dichotomy to people. Yeah, I think I think those are important points. Uh, do we have other questions from the audience? Okay, another question from Kareem. Uh, hi. Um, so I guess for uh, Dr. Kiliansky, um, I know that you were talking about, you know, not just relying on vaccines when we have a, a new novel disease that comes out. Um, what kinds of tools would you suggest that we should be, you know, uh, promoting or, or pushing from the beginning? Would it be, you know, sort of the monoclonal antibody type approach? Um, where do we look to sort of that fastest um, uh, toolkit that we'll have before having to necessarily go to vaccines? Yeah, so Kareem, that's a great question. And that's actually something that we're discussing in, in our biosurveillance class right now. Uh, you know, what we'd like to do is have that check engine light or to have something akin to a, you know, a, a glucose test um, that will tell you, 
you're sick or you're not sick, or you have a viral infection or a bacterial infection, or get down to the level of a molecular diagnostic that says, hey, you've got influenza, you've got SARS-CoV-2, or hey, you know, you don't have anything. Um, that that's really where we want to be. And you know, I know that sounds kind of like far-fetched, but we're getting really close to that. Uh, you know, things like our Fitbits and our Apple Watches and all those sorts of wearable tools all have the, those sorts of sensors which can help us with a lot of the you know, AI machine learning approaches that are being developed, all the big data that's being collected by Google and Apple, right, with these devices uh, to get to that. And that is, it, you know, one of the, the things that we, we touched on and actually brought this up at the beginning was, you know, subclinical or asymptomatic infections. Uh, and that's been a huge driver of the pandemic, right? Because we, we are prepared to handle something that you can really see that presents in a patient that you can diagnose. Uh, you know, if you're asymptomatic or you're subclinical, you know, you just don't really feel that great. You're still going to go to work. Uh, you're still going to do this or that, right? And without something telling you, you might have COVID or you do have COVID, you're going to continue to operate normally and you're going to, you know, transmit the infection to others. Uh, and so that's, that's the... I think that early warning piece, the check engine light, the full utilization of how we're plugged in electronically, right, to all of each other is going to be really critical in the future. Um, things like antibodies, too, you know, with this current pandemic, the technology wasn't quite there. And so what we did was we had an antibody cocktail, right, that you could only get through an IV. And early in the pandemic, you could only get that in a hospital. Uh, and really, for those products, they're really only efficacious if you get them early in infection. Right, not later stage disease when you actually need to go to the hospital. So you had people thinking, well, I, I kind of don't feel great. I don't know if I have COVID or not. I need to go get a test and then I need to go get antibodies, right? I mean, there's a lot of the steps in there that's in the patient's hands that, that maybe we, we don't have to have there. So and we're gonna see more broad spectrum approaches too, right? The, the Merck uh, antiviral, which they're pushing for EUA right now, that's a broad spectrum antiviral, right? That if you look at the data, it kind of works against COVID um, works okay, you know, it works in some scenarios, but it also has that same effect with other viral uh, agents too. So if we can get to a place where we're well prepared with some of these more broad spectrum approaches, we have those check engine lights or those diagnostics, which are a lot more readily available than they are now. And then we get, you know, we give ourselves some time to get to that 100 day or 200 day mark where you can get an antibody, you know, with the FDA uh, in an EUA position. Right. And technology is going to continue to advance so that, you know, we're going to have antibodies we can swallow orally or antibodies that we can give ourselves an injection of uh, that. You know, the, those early triggers are really important to allow us to have some time to catch up with the therapeutics and the vaccines. So that, that's where I'm, I'm sort of seeing, you know, the future here, not just for you know, pandemic situations, but for everyday, you know, infection control and infectious disease awareness. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, um, Sumi, is that a hand up or you're applauding uh, Andy? Yeah, I think his... I a hand up. So I figured I would just applaud. Um, but I did have a question um, and I wanna thank you guys. I feel like an interloper here um, a little bit, but it's really good to hear the DC perspective and I miss y'all. Um, well, just, just so everyone's clear, um, Sumi is a, a former ad, adjunct in the biodefense program. So uh, a couple of years ago, she would have been on this panel. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's very nice that you you joined us and, and would love to hear your perspective from, from being out on the uh, the West Coast doing the uh, the global health from the, uh, the foundation side. Yeah, no, it's um, I think it's similar. I think we all saw the the breaking points. So I think we've all seen different different parts at different times of the things that have gone wrong and everything that you've talked about um are the are the issues that we're looking at solving you know from our from from the philanthropic perspective too um I, and i actually was at for the last year and a half i was at a blood bank where the where convalescent plasma was a huge push um, despite the fact that we didn't have good clinical evidence of its efficacy. And there is, I think this is one of the areas that we really need to get stronger at too, is figuring out in advance who the stakeholders are going to be in a pandemic or an epidemic situation so that they're brought to the table earlier and they have the tools that they need to do the right thing and understand the data as it's evolving. 
Um, but that was an aside because of because of the former comment. Um, you know, my question is, you know, I think we'll all agree that um, maybe that the biggest problem, if we were to if we were to just identify one problem, was leadership with with leadership being impacted by all of the things that everybody's talked about today. And I, I do wonder how you see that changing from your perspective in DC and what needs to be done to ensure that in the future we're listening earlier to the signals um, and able to respond because remarkably we did we had we knew this was coming. We all saw this coming and that nobody could yell loudly enough to get there to be a response. So I, I'm really curious to hear the panel's comments. Thank you. I, so, so I'll take that one first. You know, as, as someone who was working, you know, very closely with a lot of the leadership here on the federal level, at, uh, you know, in in DC, um, you know, we have to be able to have our nation, our military, you know, what have you, be in a state of preparedness without compromising a lot of what we're doing, you know, in peacetime, if you will, outside of a pandemic. And and one of the things, you know, it's always crisis decision making, right? You don't want to be the one way out in front of a non-crisis, uh, and so I, you know I think that's a lot of of what we saw here in D.C. Right? I mean, we were very fortunate that we understood something was going on over in China. We had a genome sequence of the virus in, at the beginning of January. We were fortunate to to you know have that available, um, but it it still took a long time, right, to really ramp up the apparatus and really understand what was going on. And so uh, you needed someone to say this is going to be a pandemic. And mm -hmm. it's okay if it's not, right? But we're gonna prepare for it like it will be. Um, and that that's within the Department of Defense, Health and Human Services, right, the, the White House. If you go and you start closing stuff down and it turns out not to be a pandemic, right? That's politically untenable. Uh, and, and, and so we've, we've got to figure out a way to build a structure that allows us to move these preparedness pieces really sort of underneath the radar, right? So we can get our nation, right, and the international community be better prepared without sounding a whole bunch of alarm bells, right, and, and sending, you know, the international community into a crisis. Uh, because we want to be able to do this in the background as we start to see diseases emerge here or there. Maybe they will be a pandemic, maybe we won't. But, you know, we, we really want to be able to do some of that uh, below the level of a full-blown pandemic, uh, you know, like we had to do here with COVID. I also want to jump in in terms of um, situational awareness and data. <laughs> so um, every state, even right now, there's only 35 states that actually track breakthrough infe infections, the rate of that, which is insane. Um, and even at the start of the pandemic, um, the administration, the former administration, it was difficult to know what was actually going on because um, you had the news reporting certain data, you had CDC reporting other data um, because they were getting data that was reported up to the state through a mechanism that was slower uh, versus data that was scraped through county websites by um, a news source. And um, I thought it was very interesting that Johns Hopkins was almost, uh, their website that was literally created by uh, a professor and a postdoc was almost the most reliable source of what people were looking for, uh, rather than the federal government. Uh, which I think, um, again, even till today, uh, we still track data, even by each state differently. At least now, there's some centralized um, data repository in terms of what to look at for COVID information. But um, Again, we, we still don't even track data, so it's really hard to make good decisions and actionable decisions um, like shutting down the country, like um, in instituting non-pharmaceutical interventions if you don't have the data um, to make those decisions or support your decisions or point to when you're, when you're making those hard choices. So I think, um, I think that was a, a problem uh, for leadership uh, during throughout this pandemic, even now, uh, with certain uh, states saying, hey, we're not even going to track it anymore. <laughs> um, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on in the hospitals. Um, even um, some of the hospital data isn't necessarily reported up at a level that we know if a uh, hospital's full or not. Um, and and the, having that situational awareness, I think, is super important. And it still continues to be a problem. Um, but I think that's one of the things that we can work on 
Um, and we have like big data is huge in terms of what we could learn from people, um, you know, walking less, um, their ring, uh, if you don't uh, end up going to work that day or you sleep um, 10 hours instead of eight hours, um, we have that data and we just have to be able to use it and track it, so. So Ashley, on that point, one of the most telling uh, quotes coming out of the pandemic was from the, um, uh, the uh, Secretary for Homeland Security, uh, right? So he owns something uh, called the National Biosurveillance Integration Center within DHS, right? Whose job is to integrate biosurveillance data, right? Provide situation awareness. And he was up on the Hill testifying. And he's like, you know, this, this has been a rough start to the day because the Hopkins dashboard is down. Uh, and so I don't know what's going on, right? And, and so we've got, right, the highest levels of the U.S. government, right? We've spent millions and billions of dollars on some of these things. And it's a few academics at Hopkins who are providing, right, the most digestible, the most easiest to understand, you know, a stream of data. Uh, so just, you know, I love throwing that one out there because we're talking about it right now in, in, in my course. And uh, we got to fix that. Um, and, and it's hard, it's, it's, it's challenging to do within the federal government. And, you know, we kick around the idea of, should it be in the private sector, right? Is there a way to monetize this and can the private sector be more effective uh, in these areas? And I, I think there's also a bias where people inherently look to the federal government for leadership on a lot of these issues. In some cases, there really needs to be leadership. For example, the, the kind of data standards that Dr. Grant was talking about, right? You need to have national leadership to set a standard that every state will comply with instead of having 50 different standards you know, evolve. But you know, in, in the case of this pandemic, right, there was a there was a complete or almost complete lack of leadership at the federal level. And one of the, the I think the real bright spots in the pandemic response is the way that civil society uh, and, and academia and the private sector stepped up to fill in those gaps. So the uh, the COVID dashboard that, that Hopkins produced is a great example. Um, all of these, um, uh, you know, kind of do it yourself mom and pop shops that open up with to make masks. Um, and either sell them or give them away. And people who are producing, you know, kind of homemade PPE for healthcare workers when there was a shortage of that. I mean, there's just lots of these stories of innovation at the at the local level, the micro level, which you know was unfortunate necessity that we didn't have a well-functioning supply chain system and stockpile that could keep all the hospitals fully equipped with the PPE they needed, right? But I think one of the again the the silver linings, the heartening aspects of this is the degree to which a lot of communities around the country rallied and mobilized and um, we able to kind of, you know, make things better um, uh, during the course of the pandemic in, in different areas. So, um, you know, I, I think that should let, let us not just to, to, to think about how do we kind of improve national leadership in the future, but also how do we better mobilize non-government resources, right, and really have a whole society response. And I, a lot of people in D.C. kind of roll their eyes when you talk about whole of society, but it, it really, I mean, I think this pandemic really did demonstrate that, that it's a thing. And it's just that we need to have better ways of making it a reality instead of just a talking point or a buzzword, which it usually is. Um, so, you know, thank you for all the work that, that you've been doing in that, in that regard. Okay, we have a couple of time for maybe one last question. Let, let's let Adam ask his question since he hasn't had a chance yet. Go ahead, Adam. So, uh, we, the question has been raised about the federal government not, you know, not being um, as effective as maybe the private sector. And I, I work in the federal government, and I'm, one thing I, I feel, and I want to see if anyone else feels the same way, is, is do you think we're so ineffective because we're just too big? There's just too many agencies out there with their hands in the honeypot, and you know, no one really wants to take responsibility, but they all want to get the glory. Um, but so. I just want to hear any, if anybody has the same kind of thoughts or. I guess one of my thoughts is at the core of it, you have to rely on private industry to make the vaccine or make the personal protective equipment or operate our hospitals. So I think um, even if the federal government uh, does everything they can, they still have to rely on private industry, that public-private partnership um, to actually get things executing, get things done. Um, and then, you know, just for instance, looking at antibiotics, even if the federal government wants to fund it, um, there's companies are saying it's not worth their time or effort. So we can't really make new antibiotics uh, or it's very difficult because the private industry doesn't want to play. So I just think, um, 
I think it's because we can't act in isolation. And But I think you bring up a good point in terms of there's a lot of different federal agencies and they have a lot of different budgets <laughs> and they all have a lot of different missions. Um, so just for instance, if you gave um, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense budget, um, maybe it would be a little bit different um, in terms of um, you know, our, our response or, or how, uh, how we would be prepared, but I'll let other people jump in. Yeah, Adam, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, really this working on this problem outside of a pandemic, nobody wants to do it, which is one of the big problems. And, you know, we don't have a super dedicated infrastructure to prepare for this outside of an emergency. You know, uh, the lead agency for a lot of this health and human services, um, you know, the offices that do some of the planning and, and you know, um, preparation for this stuff is buried way, way, way down, you know, in the org chart underneath an assistant secretary. And they get pulled into the current crisis response to, right, if it's a hurricane or a tornado or whatever. Um, so it's really hard. There's just not a lot of finite resources to day to day do this type of due diligence that you need to do to actually be prepared. Uh, so I, I think that's a big that's a big issue. And then naturally during a crisis, right, uh, you know, um, everyone I, I think definitely wants to help. And it's a question of organizing uh, those responses, you know, efficiently and making sure you're you're coordinating all the activities that are going on. And right during an emergency, a lot of that goes to DHS and FEMA, right? And they had a very large role to play uh, in the pandemic. And, you know, it's not something that they do every day, right? Uh, so they're usually focused on other sorts of uh, emergency management issues. So um, yeah, that's just, just something to keep in mind that, you know, the, the steady state here, there's not like there's a lot of money, resources, people doing this job every day outside of the pandemic. So we, we've covered a, a lot of ground here and, and talked a lot of, about a lot of the different aspects uh, of the pandemic, which is an, obviously an incredibly complex topic, but there are a lot of things we only scratched the surface of and other topics we didn't bring up at, at all. But hopefully this has been an uh, interesting uh, um, conversation uh, for those of you who, who've tuned in uh, and gives you a sense of the kinds of issues and topics that uh, we uh, look at within the biodefense program. Uh, since we're not just looking at traditional biological weapons, they're actually looking at the whole spectrum of biological risks from, uh, you know, pandemics, emerging infectious diseases, Dewey's research, um, and and of course, you know, the, the bioterrorism and, and bioweapons. Um, if uh, you're interested in learning more about the, the program, uh, we are having an uh, info session for the master's program uh, next week on October 21st um, at um, uh, uh, 6.30. Uh, PM, um, and that's a, a virtual session, so you can tune in for that. And I think Travis uh, Major is going to include the uh, information for that in the in the chat. Um, and you can always go to uh, visit us at uh, char.gmu.edu. And I put into the the chat the the links to stay in touch with the biodefense program, either through our newsletter called the Pandora Report, or follow us on Twitter. So uh, again, thank you. I want to thank my panelists, my professors for uh, contributing their, their time this evening to talk about these issues. And thank all of you, those of you who tuned in um, and thank you for your great questions and for your attention. Uh, and so with that, I will wish you all a good night.